grace, peace, and joy are yours from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The word of God that we want to consider this morning is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21, beginning with verse 28. We heard this before in the New International Version, and I'll be reading it in the New King James Version throughout the course of the sermon. So for now, we bow our heads for a word of prayer. O Holy Spirit, come to us as our teacher this morning. You have given us this word by inspiration. We ask that you would now use this word to teach each of us what you would have us know. Open our minds that we understand it more fully and then apply it to ourselves more faithfully and touch our hearts with it, that we live by it continually. We ask this for the sake of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior, dear fellow redeemed, why did Jesus use so many parables in his teaching? Why did he again and again make up those earthly stories with heavenly meanings as someone has defined parables? What value did he see in using that particular way to instruct us? Why didn't he just tell us things plain and simple? It may surprise you to know that our Lord's purpose was to make things simple. It was to help us see things we might miss otherwise and to gain insight that we apply to ourselves. The story we have in our text for this morning is a good illustration of that. Suppose Jesus had just told us about two different kinds of people, some very religious people, who followed all the rules and regulations and lived the most upright life. And then he told about another group of people who lived the way they wanted to most of their lives, but then came back to God and asked for his mercy. If he then asked us, which of those two groups of people is doing the will of the Heavenly Father, what would you say? Wouldn't you choose the first group, the religious group, those who kept all the rules and regulations? But when we look at the parable that Jesus tells, that really is the same thing about two different kinds of people, we come to a different answer. We'll see that as we look at the text before us and use it to answer this question, who is doing the Father's will? Who is doing the Father's will? In raising that question in this parable, Jesus tells a very simple story. We read here, beginning with verse 28. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go today in my vine- work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. The story that Jesus uses, tells here uses a very familiar setting, familiar at least as far as the people of Israel are concerned. He talks about a man who owns a vineyard. And even if you go to Israel today, you find that many of the hills are etched with the vineyards over and over because they raise a lot of grapes there. Now in this particular story, the man has a vineyard, but he needs help caring for it. So he goes to his two sons. He goes to the first son and says, go work in my vineyard. And the son says, I will. But then he doesn't. The man goes to the second son and says, you too, go out and work in my vineyard with your brother. He said, I'm not going to do that. But then he regrets it, and he does go and work. Now, what is the point that Jesus is talking about with that very simple story? A story that may even reflect the daily life of his time and the way certain sons responded to their fathers who were vineyard owners. What is he trying to get across to us? 
The basic outlines of the story are clear. We know the man in the story, the owner of the vineyard, is our Lord himself. And the vineyard is often used in the Bible as a picture of the church, as all those the Lord has drawn to himself through his love in Jesus. That's the way Isaiah uses the picture of the vineyard, for example, in chapter 5 of his prophecy. He says, I will sing a song of my beloved. My beloved had a vineyard. And he talks about those he has in his vineyard as his followers. But what does Jesus especially want us to understand about the two different sons? Whom do they represent? Who are the sons who say no and yes? We get the answer if we look at the end of this text. Jesus says, which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. How shocking Jesus' application of this particular simple little parable. He's talking to the most religious people of his day, Pharisees. Pharisee always has a bad connotation for us today. In fact, even the word itself stands for one who is hypocritical, who says one thing but really does something else. And yet remember in this day, they were the most upright godly people around. They didn't just follow the law of Moses with, with its 900 and some different laws. They added an equal and greater number of laws to their own lives. They even regulated how many steps they could take on the Sabbath, how much they had to give out of everything they owned to the Lord. And yet, what does Jesus tell these upright religious people here? He says the tax collectors and harlots are going to enter the kingdom of God before you. What an insult that is to these religious people. How can our Lord tell them that? How could he possibly tell you or me, for example, that tax collectors and harlots may be closer to the kingdom of God than you are? Jesus explains here, when he talks about the way the Pharisees and other religious people responded to John the Baptist, John came preaching a way of righteousness, Jesus says. He told the people how they can truly be right with God, how they can stand before him absolutely sinless and clothed in his own righteousness. And that way, of course, was by turning to Jesus, by believing in him and trusting in him as their savior. But what did they do? They told God, no, we're going to be religious, but we're going to earn our standing with you. All these rules and regulations that we keep, all the laws that we've added to the laws of Moses and then observe, that's going to be our way of making ourselves righteous. In other words, they believe in what we call a work righteousness, earning our place with God. And it's surprising how often that's the approach that people take these days. You see it in a variety of ways. I came across it just a couple of weeks ago when I went and talked to the leader of the Mormon organization in our area, I went and discussed with him a new book on Mormonism that I had just received, and I wanted to make sure that that was exactly what the Mormon organization teaches, not what this author says it teaches. During the course of the discussion, he first of all said that the book reflected his teachings, but then he added, that he believed his relationship with God depended on, and this is almost a quote, his obedience to the rites and ordinances of the church. 
That's a quotation from Doctrines and Covenants that the Mormon organization uses as one of their sources of teaching. And notice that obedience to the rites and ordinances of the church. So the Mormon organization gives people rules and regulations to follow, just as the Pharisees did. And if they obey them, then he was confident that he was acceptable to God. He didn't say he trusted in Jesus as his Savior, as the one who took away his sins and covered him in his own righteousness. Instead, he relied on his obedience. And that is not an extreme, unlikely case. You see it come in a variety of ways. Not all that long ago, I was talking to a Lutheran from another organization besides Wells, and he objected to the fact that we're always preaching sin and grace, law and gospel. You don't have to do that, he said. Be more positive. Just tell people how to live, how to get along with one another, and everything will be fine. Notice where the emphasis was. It's not in the cross which forms the center of our church and which draws our attention again and again. It's on what the individuals do. They want to please God, but on what terms? Theirs. In other words, they are self-focused rather than Savior-directed. They are looking inward rather than upward. And then the verdict of Jesus applies to them. John came preaching the way of righteousness in Jesus, but you did not believe it. And as we mentioned, this happens, unfortunately, far too often. Sometimes it may even happen to us. Now, you can't imagine that, can you? After all, the gospel is our most precious treasure. We're observing that again during this celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. What joy to know that through men such as Martin Luther, the Lord brought, brought back that pure teaching regarding the way to salvation. And it comes only in Jesus and all that he has done as our Savior. And yet, sometimes we can very subtly slip over into our own form of righteousness. Do you, for example, ever practice comparative righteousness? Now, what is that? Basically, it means, do you ever think you are righteous because compared to some people you know, you're a whole lot better off than they are? Sometimes that kind of thinking can creep in on us without our realizing us it. We just don't accept the fact that we have nothing at all we can plead before our God. How many here, for example, think of themselves as the people Jesus mentions here in our text, as the tax collectors and the harlots? No woman here would ever think that she's a harlot who sells her body out on the street, and no man would claim that he's a heartless tax collector who doesn't care about the well-being of others. And yet remember what Jesus said one time, if any man looks at a woman to lust after her, what has he done? He's already committed adultery in his heart. In other words, just the thought can make us as guilty before God as the actual act of adultery. Or if someone hates his brother, how does the Lord describe him? He is a murderer. He says, and we know that murderers have no life abiding in them. So just the wrong kind of feeling about someone can put us in that very same category that, that we seem to say yes to God but by our attitude, we really say no. When we hear this story, first of all, we need to ask ourselves, what is my attitude to Jesus right now? Do I recognize how desperately I need him? That I can depend on salvation 
only because of my Lord and not because of myself. Sometimes we're slow in admitting that, especially when we see what others around us are like. But remember what Jesus says in our text, the tax collectors and prostitutes enter the kingdom before these seeming religious people. And Jesus emphasizes that because we read again in the last part, which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe. It's interesting that the tax collectors and harlots or prostitutes here get such high credit from the Lord. And why? Not because of their lifestyle, obviously, but for the very simple reason that they believed in Jesus as their Savior. They recognized that the verdict that society had of them was absolutely accurate. That they had nothing of themselves that would make them acceptable to God. And so they came to Jesus for that way of righteousness that John the Baptist talked about. But the religious people not only refused to do that, but they persisted in that throughout their lives. How amazing that they were so close to the truth, so near to the one who would lead them to life everlasting, and yet they would not humble themselves before the Savior. And that can still happen to us. How much more important then that we become like the second group of people the Lord mentions here, the tax collectors and the harlots, realizing that only through Jesus does that door of heaven swing wide open to us, and only because of Jesus' work are we assured of life everlasting with the Father. Sometimes the biggest threat to us as Christians is that we simply become too content now understand how we mean that. Our Lord wants us to be content. Content that all our sins have been removed. That our place in heaven has already been set aside because our name was written in the book of life. That our eternity with our Lord is absolutely guaranteed. But we can easily become content with the way we're living and what we've done for the Lord, and then make that the basis for our eternal salvation. But Jesus points out once again that only those who fall before him in humility can be sure of life everlasting. Perhaps we can learn from an incident that took place just the last week or so. You've heard all about this movie producer in Hollywood who was accused of sexually assaulting a variety of people. What made his act so terrible? Was it the number of times that he assaulted women, five, 10, 15, or 20? The number has nothing to do with it, does it? Even the actual act is not the problem. It's that he did not show love and consideration to people, as Paul talked about in our epistle reading for this morning. There he said, we are to show consideration for each other after the example of Jesus himself. And sometimes we need to learn that same thing, that the way we treat others can be most despicable. If we have no consideration, for example, for those who are in need, what comfort can we take from that? We know we stand under the judgment of God. If we do not reach out with a message of salvation to people who are lost and hurting, then we are passing by an opportunity to share the joy of salvation with them. How vital, therefore, that we recognize the way of righteousness is the only way for us, but also for all those around us. By the grace of God, you and I know about that way. Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit 
to work in us through baptism and his word, and to give us the absolute confidence that we are at peace with God, that nothing now separates us from him. And we want to live in that assurance as well every day of our lives. We want to live as people who have been redeemed by the Lord to serve him and work in his kingdom. May God grant that this little parable that seems so simple move us anew to consider our relationship with the Lord. May it lead us to fall humbly at the foot of the cross and then in the fullness of forgiveness, may it move us to rise up and carry out the Lord's work in whatever way we can. May God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen.